for this evening is about building brands. And here's what I think. I think that building brands is simple. All you have to do is everything. Uh, you really do, despite the fact that a lot of marketing commentators out there seem to think that success comes from being on one or other of this divide. And right now, it's the list on the right-hand side that tends to be a bit more fashionable. But these are false polarities. It's perfectly possible, desirable even, to constantly produce incremental innovation while looking for that disruptive category killer. Uh, we should certainly shore up our points of parity and also think about difference. And traditional consumer understanding and behavioural economics can both help us build better marketing plans. Now, I don't have time to talk about all of these, so I'm just going to talk about three or maybe four. Let's start with the big one, uh, the false polarity between short-term sales and long-term brand building. It's as though you can't achieve the one without the other. Now, some of you, I'm certain, are going to have an active investor in your shareholder base, and I'm pretty certain that this is the kind of thing that they're going to say to you. Uh, sales are flat again this quarter. And, and I can imagine them saying, saying this to you. And is the marketer's answer really just this? You know? Uh, even a smart mind, like Martin Sorrell, can be drawn into this side of the argument. So in a recent Marketing Week article, he's quoted as saying this, short-termism is the biggest threat to marketers. But is this really all we can offer? A kind of brand jam tomorrow, not today? Why do we put long-term brand building and short-term sales goals into two separate, separate boxes? More specifically, why can't short-term sales initiatives link up and create a coherent brand narrative? I think they can. Here's an example. It's of a direct-to-consumer brand I happen to like, Beauty Pie. And here's the response I got when I placed an order. Uh, it's the circled bit. We received your order, and we've got it covered like a pair of dark circles under our incredible under-eye concealer. Uh, they used the response to the order to sell, but they did it in a way that was very beauty pie, building their brand as a beauty insider with top-quality products. Now, the receiver might take up that offer, or they might not. But either way, they're reminded of the brand, and the overall response adds up to a brand narrative. So when we're asked this, are our marketing teams focused on short-term sales or long-term brand building, I think the answer should be yes. Uh, we play on both sides of the line. It's not an either-or. And just sticking with Beauty Pie for a moment, I want to touch briefly on another polarity. Now, we could spend the entire evening talking about this, um, which we won't. So while the Ehrenberg Bass School of Marketing are, very, are absolutely right to emphasize the importance of penetration to brand growth, it's very narrow to say that marketers should only pursue penetration and that money spent on existing heavy users is wasted, as though those loyalists are in some sort of box and they never speak to others. In the real world, it's a bit like, thi it's a bit like this. Uh, that's me and my friend Jules. And even if I hadn't tried the concealer, I might mention it. And she doesn't even know Beauty Pie, and so then I'm off and selling it for them. Um, so an initiative aimed at a loyalist or a frequent purchaser can play a part in increasing penetration. Here's another classic polarity. It's usually applied to communications. Should it be fact-based and rational or emotional and heartfelt? Um, and the first thing to say here, actually, is that this decision it has been subject to fashion over the years. All through those classic burn-back decades, creative work tended to be highly rational, very charming, but rational. Uh, and here it's about the number of coats on a paint of car, a uh, uh, number of coats of paint on a car. And even Avis's, Avis's famous We Try Harder was based on the logic of being number two. More recently, communications has swung the other way, and emotional advertising is encouraged. It's encouraged by some research companies, some of whom tend to be non-agnostic. They've decided how advertising works. Here's one that declares a view. Emotional advertising leads to long-term brand growth, so we taste, test emotional response. 
But what that doesn't take in, into account is that effectiveness of communications isn't just a bilateral axis between you and your consumers. Uh, because there's a third actor in there called the competition. And if you only play on one side of that divide, say emotional, you leave open the other flank for attack. It's a bit like playing a baseline rally and always standing on the right-hand side of the court and never going back to the centre after each shot. You're inviting the opposition to slam the ball down that unguarded piece of court. And, and I observed this happening, actually, a few years ago in US pain relief. Uh, so Tylenol is a leading but quite old-fashioned brand in, in the US in pain relief. And they changed their communications to focus on highly emotional message that was all about the nature of modern family and modern care. And it had virtually nothing to say about the effectiveness of the product. And this, of course, leaves the court wide open to their biggest competitor, Advil, who just stepped straight in there with strong messaging about effectiveness. And this, of course, led to Tylenol seeking a bit more balance about how they pre presented their brand. Some brands go for that, well, let's have emotional communications during these months or on that side or in this, in this media and more fact-based stuff over here. But surely it's better to seek for unity where one side always nourishes the other. And I think the way to approach this, as is often the case, is to start with the consumer. And actually, to start with the consumer and the theory of the journey of self, uh, which was first talked about in 1986, actually, by these psychologists, uh, Hazel Marcus and Paula Nurius, and they had a seminal paper about the journey of self in 1986 in American psychologists. Uh, and basically, the theory is this. We all have an actual self, and we definitely want to avoid moving backwards to that worry state self, which many of the speakers were sort of veering towards before you all arrived. Um, we kind of know, we know what the fantasy self is that we'd like to be, but we also know we're probably not going to make it, actually, all the way over to that fantasy self. So we think we might just make it over to our idealised self. And what was really interesting about what Marcus and Nurius found in their research is that we're cognitively motivated. So that means that we do stuff to try and make it towards our idealised self. And we see this, don't we, in Instagram feeds, mainly, at the moment, actually. Um, but your brand can play a role here. And the role of your brand is this, to help consumers, both practically and symbolically, on their journey towards that more idealised self. So practically is what you do functionally and factually. And symbolically is the, is the values, is the brand that you put around it. A really good example of this that I saw recently when I was judging for the IPA Effectiveness Awards is Yorkshire Tea. Uh, and their whole brand is about where everything is done proper. But, but it got people to reevaluate the quality of the tea that they drink. Uh, a very functional message about better quality tea, but it appealed at a symbolic level to people who like to do things properly. And, and then they, they kind of reinforced that through some incredibly charming advertising using, for example, the Brownlee brothers as cycle couriers at Yorkshire Tea, because Yorkshire Tea would only want to do things the very best way. So they lock together their functional difference with a, with a, with a message that was about the idealised self. Third up is the rise of direct-to-consumer brands and the threat that they pose. And the narrative seems to kind of go, should we fight them or should we join them? Well, you have to fight anyone who's taking your share, but you don't have to emulate their business model. It might be worth emulating some of the characteristics that these brands have picked up, which I think is quite interesting. And here's one of them, suppleness of thought. Direct-to-consumer wasn't a new way of doing business. What they have done is look at a classic business model and made it relevant for today's digital connectivity. And the classic business model is this. It's the lemonade stand. One product, very narrow focus, indivisibility between producer, retail, and customer service. And it's exactly what these guys have done. Away just does luggage. Glossier just does beauty. Gobi just does toothbrushes. And I think for the trick for marketers is to look 
at other categories. Look outside your category, look at other categories, and ask if what they're doing could be applied to yours. So suppleness of thought about what's going on. The second thing to emulate, to emulate might be their fantastic consumer intimacy. So the kind of poster boy of direct consumer is Andy Dunn. And he highlights, I think, what ought to be obvious to marketers. Uh, you know, a, a, a huge focus on, on customer experience and its physical products and strong service experience at the same time. Now, this ought to be obvious to most marketers, but sometimes we lose focus on that co consumer intimacy and what we can do to drive it. One more to finish, and it's a bit different because communication and brand gurus tend to draw these two things together. Most notably, Jim Stengel in Grow, who attempted to show that if you have purpose, you have profit. Now, I don't buy that. Uh, it can happen, but it's not guaranteed and it's not causal. But if you do have a declared social purpose, when the chips are down, you have to prioritise it and it could cost you. Uh, in a recent Marketing Week column, I talk about a particular example from the US. It's this one, CVS. It's the US's biggest pharmacy, and in 2014, they changed their name to CVS Health because they kind of gone through a process about what they were really in business for, and they defined their purpose as to help people on their path to a better health. And here's what happened next. Norman de Greff, the CMO, after a lot of internal battles, pushed through a big change, which was to stop selling cigarettes and tobacco. Now, I know this is a bit weird for a pharmacy anyway to be selling cigarettes and tobacco, but it was the category norm, I promise you, and all five competitors did it and still do. But de Grev saw the hypocrisy, actually, in the purpose and pushed it through, and in one year, it cost them $2 billion. So purpose can cost you actually. It's, there's not a direct link through to profit. Now, your business may not have a declared social purpose, but I would argue that all real, <laughs> properly nourished brands do have a social purpose, a deep one that takes us all the way back to the genesis of brands and how they came about in the first place, because that dates back to a time when people were routinely cheated by shifting and unaccountable traders, when dirty practices were the norm. And actually, it's not that long ago. It was the late 19th century. And it was these types of practices. Chalk was added to flour. Water was added to butter. Sand was mixed with sugar. And scales were rigged in favor of the trader. And by the time the consumers could see that they'd been cheated, the traders had just kind of upped and gone. There was no way that they could get back at them. So, more upright citizens, often motivated by ethics, like the Quakers, created enduring brands that people could recognise, and that fostered trust. But how exactly? And I think the answer comes down to vulnerability, and it's vulnerability on the brand owner's side. Because investment in the brand plus recognition equals vulnerability. Those brand owners knew that they had a lot to lose if the product wasn't right, and that very vulnerability therefore leads to trust because they've got to get it right. And today, communications-led or very thinly nourished pop-up brands will never get that deep trust. They'll do okay for a while, but never as brands that will reap the ongoing commercial rewards that trust can really bring. And that's why real investment in building, in committing to building strong and meaningful brands is well worth the time. Because when you do it well, it does bring commercial rewards, but there's also a societal good to it too. Thank you.